Okay. Uh, yes, I'm, I am very old. Thank you for that reminder. Uh, it, it was meant in, the, <laughs> in a good sense. Yes, well, I guess, uh, I guess I could try to claim the excuse that uh, so much time has passed by since those that I've forgotten everything I knew. But I think there was zero knowledge to begin with, so uh, it's not going to work. I got to be prepared for these things. OK. Um, yes, I'll tell you um, the way that we think that NIST sort of works in this space of standards. I will then tell you about the privacy preserving, uh, privacy enhancing crypto project that we're um, reviving this year. Then uh, we have read the documents that, uh, that this organization has put forth, and we've interacted with the, uh, m some of the members. And I'll give you a perspective on, on what we see there. And then I'll have some conclusions. OK, so crypto standards are at NIST. I'll give you a, a history, brief history, okay, kind of milestones. So the data encryption standard was uh, published in 1977. This standard uh, you know, was, became the workhorse at the time for encryption, symmetric key. And it was produced by the National Security Agencies of the US. Um, and it was you know, promoted by NIST. In the 1990s, there was you know, codifying the way that we should do uh, public key cryptography. So a number of documents came out at that time. By the late 90s, um, DES had, you know, uh, sort of was coming to the end of its useful life. And the world was not any, any more the type that they would likely accept that some national uh, intelligence agency in the US you know, uh, produces behind closed doors the next big uh, uh, symmetric key encryption standard. So uh, NIST organized an international competition that uh, yielded the AES. And it was, you know, um, this was won by a group in, uh, in Belgium, basically. Between the, uh, around the time that I joined NIST, uh, we had a really nasty thing happen. Uh, uh, apparently, an intelligence agency managed to get into NIST standards a variant of a public key, or sorry, of a random number generator that was apparently backdoored. I have to say apparently all the time because I think you guys are filming. So, uh, <laughs> was apparently backdoored. And um, this was a significant stain on us. Um, the, uh, the design was clear that it could be backdoored. And I think you know, we've tried to track you know, how did all this come down? How did it happen? Um, I wasn't involved in the computer security division at the time. It was a different division than NIST. So I, I'm not sure exactly what happened. But it becomes very murky. And we wanted to make sure that nothing like this ever happens again. And so we, you know, a bunch of measures were taken. An external commission was asked to you know, look into how we do things and try to you know, tell us how, how do we prevent this from ever happening again. The main, uh, the main conclusions of this study was that, uh, well, we need to do everything very transparently, very open, and, and with buy-in from the community and that we needed to grow in resources. There's, when I joined this, uh, I, I was joining the, the computer security division around 2006 or seven. We were, I think, the, the cryptographic technologies group to which, of which uh, uh, I am a member, and now Angela here and Luis are also members, has grown by you know, 100%. It's grown to twice the original size. And the people that we have hired over the last years these young people are really remarkable. They're really good. 
So you know, I spent most of my life in academia, and I wish I had, uh, I don't think I had the, the average level of knowledge and competency that I have at NIST now. So it's, it's very nice to be there. OK, so in uh, the, I think this happened towards the end of the 2010s, no, 2000s. Uh, there, were some, um, there were some unexpected attacks on SHA-1. The, that was uh, a workhorse of um, hashing that was also, had also been made by the National Security Agency you know, a long time ago. And we, we went into sort of crisis mode at NIST, and we said, this, this looks troublesome. We need to replace SHA-1 and possibly SHA-2 by a new standard. And again, we're going to do this you know, with an open competition. And again, the Belgians won somehow. Uh, so um, since then, what's happened is that we are less worried about SHA-2. But SHA-3, the outcome of this competition, is a very beautiful object, which has many uh, very nice um, applications. And you know, we really like it. And the SHA-1 truly did become uh, fully broken in the intervening years. Right now, the current situation, we have three major projects. We are responding to the, the, you know, this, this, the possibility that a quantum computer will be built um, in the you know, not too distant future. Yeah. Uh, we recognize by, by previous experience that it takes a long time from the time that we issue a standard to the time that is fully adopted by society. So we need to act now on the, the subject of post-quantum cryptography. Uh, because 10 or 15 years from now, there, this actually may become a real threat to uh, public key crypto. Okay? So that's you know, responding to, to, to a need that sort of everybody agrees is there. We have lightweight cryptography. Uh, this is responding to you know, multiple requests, enough, enough uh, requests from industry uh, that something like this is needed, Light, lightweight versions of, of cryptographic primitives. And then the third uh, major effort now is this threshold cryptography. This is more, uh, more recent genesis. And um, we think this, this will, will help a lot with uh, security. Okay. So all of, these, all of these efforts have slightly different um, uh, genesis. Uh, and, uh, This is a property of what we do. We, we, we have multiple approaches to things. We can respond to crisis. We can respond to needs. We can re respond to, 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 to requests. Okay? Uh, however, there's, you know, we have, there's only about you know, 20 of us in the cryptography, um, cryptographic engineering group. We have limited resources. So to the extent of our resources, we try to determine what's more urgent, and we, and we go with that. So the, some of the approaches, these have been you know, international competitions, the AES and SHA-3. We also look at other standards organizations. You know, if, if they have done a lot of work and, and the, it looks like there's a, a significant consensus about those standards being uh, useful, then we, we try to adopt those. We also develop some new standards that in-house. So, Sometimes we become convinced or, or are convinced that certain uh, things are, are needed. Um, for that to happen, there has to be enough maturity of the field. We really are not doing this research in-house. We're recognizing that the research uh, knowledge in the community is good enough to, uh, to produce something that is really useful. So the... Um, 856C about, about uh, the key generations and the uh, modes of operations uh, fall in that category. Then we have something which are similar to competition, but not a competition. So the, in post-quantum cryptography, for example, we, we started this some years ago, and we, we're not too, as sure 
that everybody understands all the, all the possible pitfalls there are in this area so that we can codify a set of rules by which we're going to run a competition and, and, you know, and, and have some uh, very clear statement uh, about how to, th that we'll pick one of these. So, so these are sort of processes that we try to orchestrate, try to, to, to direct with the, cho with the aim of achieving uh, a community consensus around uh, new standards. And we're always open to other approaches. I'm going to leave this slide in, uh, in, in this slide deck for you to see if you want. This is uh, you know, a, a partial list of some of the standards that we, partial list of the standards that we, uh, we support, we, and also guidelines, documents. Um, you know, one of the things is that maintaining this is quite a bit of work. So again, we come up to the issue of our resources. Okay, privacy at NIST. So, so privacy at NIST is, lives in several places. Um, there's this uh, NIST privacy framework. This is largely policy and management guidelines around uh, the issue of how does an does a, does a enterprise manage uh, privacy risk on behalf of itself and uh, on the, the behalf of, the, of the, the users that appear in their data. Okay. Uh, the idea that they're, these people that are running this are not cryptographers. They're, they're privacy people and they're trying to codify that. What do we mean by privacy? What are the goals we want? Let's establish some common uh, set of terms so that we could at least talk about it, some principles, consensus, and all that. The, this will produce a, a, a privacy framework document for which there's a workshop uh, coming in Atlanta. Uh, and there, you know, if you want, if you're really concerned about privacy in th this type of effort, then that's a place where you can put in, uh, put forth some input. There's also a privacy engineering uh, project and they've issued some de-identification challenges. So, so there's this issue that there's these, um, these databases containing useful stuff. We want to extract from these databases useful information to serve, to inform policy, or to serve the public in various ways. But you know, doing so may expose PII, and so how do we de-identify these databases so that we can extract useful information? So, so uh, uh, differential cryptography, this is highly influenced by differential cryptography. Okay, now coming to our project, this is the uh, privacy engineering crypto. This has been dormant. We had, a, we, we had I organized a conference about maybe seven or eight years ago, where I, some of you were probably there. Uh, the idea was, you know, computing on encrypted data, doing stuff, useful stuff with encrypted data. And at the time I thought, okay, I'm gonna get these really smart people together with these, all these like uh, people who need applications. We put them together in a room and out comes really uh, good, 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 um, good applications, good software that will solve the problems that these doctors are having when they're trying to, to share data you know, and stuff. Uh, Everybody came, and after much thinking I, and, and, and trying to evaluate what was happening and stuff, it became clear that this wasn't going to happen. It, was, it wasn't enough to just have one meeting, grab a bunch of researchers, bunch of, uh, grab a bunch, a bunch of consumers of, their, uh, of what these researchers could provide, and just uh, let the synergies grow. Uh, is much harder than that. So this is a happy coincidence that as, as we've been toying for the last year or so of, of reviving this, uh, because maybe now there's more, more uh, the field is more mature, the, 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 this, this, that, this coincidence that zero, uh, that this organization is, is going through this, uh, 
this process and that so many really good people are involved and there's just all this interest from industry. It's really a happy coincidence. Okay, from our perspective as government people, uh, and this, you know, this may reflect some of my biases. I see zero uh, uh, secure multi-party computation as being uh, really important. And I, I tend to see zero knowledge proofs a lot. Of, uh, I, I, I tend to think of zero knowledge proofs <coughs> as supporting SMPC. Okay, and of course it does much more than that, but I keep thinking of SMPC problems that we have. The, the way, you know, there's, there's, there's three of us, so what can we do? And uh, we, our approach, I think, will be to develop useful reference materials. That includes documents and possible uh, implementations. Yeah. So through this, we want to be able to assess the state of things in different sub-areas. Uh, we want to motivate real use applications or proofs of concepts. We want to frame development of, of future standards. So may, maybe we, this can progress all the way to standards. Uh, and also frame you know, future discussions. Possibly through, through uh, you know, short of standards, reference materials can also serve to support interoperability for companies they want to do this now and the standard won't be there for another you know, 10, five years. And the context in which we want to do this is, is privacy enhancing cryptography use cases. I picked, uh, we picked uh, a few of these to briefly go through in the next few minutes. Um, we had a, a fourth one which I'll I'll just have to tell it because I, I wasn't, uh, uh, I didn't know of Shafi's talk and it, it, it came, um, it, 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 is, it is relevant to, relevant to mention now. Um, so this, this FISA court, you know, this is effort to get them to stop collecting information that they shouldn't be collecting or in particular, stop storing information that they shouldn't be storing the intelligence agencies. And that was part of a, you know, of a, group of trying to discuss how do we go around doing that. Um, put it in perspective, the intelligence agencies have you know, over 100,000 targets, meaning names of people and organizations that they can target for genuine uh, uh, intelligence uh, objectives, preventing terrorism mostly and drug trafficking. Uh, The, the way that, that this is done is that through these, uh, these laws, they, they, they can compel it, uh, companies like Google to go into the databases and give them everything that they think you know, satisfies some uh, search terms or requirements. So here comes uh, Google sends a whole bunch of data. And in that data, there's information that they shouldn't have. So what they can't do, the American intelligence agencies, they cannot, uh, they cannot um, target US persons. That's defined as roughly American citizens anywhere or people residing in the US. So here comes an intelligence uh, agent, uh, you know, a, one of their analysts and gets this stuff with John Smith you know, ordering pizza at this place. And, and it, that got cut up because some terrorists also ordered pizza at the same place. And they got caught up in this you know, gathering of information. And um, the intelligence agency says, well, you know, don't worry about it. We're just going to store this stuff. Uh, in theory, we'd have to, to throw it away if John Smith happens to be a US person. But how do we tell, how do we, how do we tell if, this is a, uh, the, um, if John Smith is a US person? Uh, the only way we can do that is to target them. But we're not allowed to target US persons. So we might be breaking the law. And, uh, and it's just better if we just wrap everything and store it somewhere. You know, so I go and say, no, 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 come on. 
Google knows if, you know, Google certainly knows because they're trying to sell stuff to this guy and invade his privacy in all kinds of ways. They certainly know if you should be allowed, if you're allowed to target this person. So you should do an SMPC uh, pr protocol by which you, you learn which ones you shouldn't be. So technically, that is completely doable. Uh, but, uh, you know, then comes the, the lawyers that main counsel, well, you know, that is, a, that is a, in order for us to do that, we'd have to get a law passed explicitly telling us to do that. We cannot just do stuff because we think it's good. In the U.S., the laws have to actually tell you, do this. You cannot do things because you don't think it's illegal. It's a, you know. So this is, uh, so it becomes like a much harder problem than just technical. Anyhow, uh, that's been my experience so far with that. And you know, the effort goes on. Uh, also, this, these are moving targets, because if you'd spent five years trying to, uh, to, to, to get them to do the right thing in this context, the context has shifted by the time you actually get it done. Now they're not using that law. They're using the new uh, secret um, uh, decision by some judge, as you know, Shafi was pointing out. OK, so back to the ones that I actually did prepare to talk. Um, broker identification. This is, this is a, um, a problem that uh, is more serious in the US uh, and other countries like Britain and Canada, where we don't have a um, citizen ID cards. The problem of identifying yourself remotely to a government agency, say to request you know, health services from some uh, uh, national health institute or something, uh, is, involves you having to authenticate themselves. And right now, that is hard, uh, particularly for people who have mobility problems, are not easily located at any one house live in rural areas very far from some office where they could go and show some other form of ID and you know, identify themselves. So at a very high level, the government says, OK, here's what we can do. We can, everybody has trust relationships with some, with, some, uh, with some institution that we also trust. This lady that lives in a rural area probably has a bank account somewhere, and she can identify herself to her bank. So let's make a protocol that, that leverages all those trust relations. Uh, and the way that the protocol would go is, is the user would, um, uh, in order to access some service from a service provider, would, would get a, a um, would authenticate the, their identity to an identity provider, and then somehow the credentials would make it all the way to the service provider. And this would be done through a hub. And the hub was mainly there, as far as I can tell, for privacy purposes. So this, this man in the middle there, well, I shouldn't call it man in the middle in this audience. This, this intermediate, uh, 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 intermediary is there to protect the, the privacy of the user, mainly. Uh, the idea is that the bank should not should not know that you're accessing a lot health services, right? For obvious reasons, right? Or that the um, or that the government should find out that you bank in that really, really crummy bank instead of a very nice bank. That, that sort of idea, those sort of issues. Okay, so why we picked this example is because we, as we read these documents of, of zero. Uh, Zero K proof, we found this as one of the uh, use cases. And, and also because I had, ex I had extensive and painful experience with this. I was part of this project and I failed. Okay. So the way this went down is that, is that the cons by the time people like me who were going to try to advise other people into how to actually make this happen, the constraint, many design constraints are already in place. 
You can't say, you know, this is not how I would solve this problem. No, no, that was discussed for seven months in some other committee, and this is what you have, this is what you work with. Okay. Furthermore, there's a government procurement process by which it has all kinds of, of, of criteria which are non-technical. Now, I also work with the intelligence agencies where they just go and say, you know, I know these guys at that university know how to do this, I'm going to just hire you. Now, the government has to go through this procurement process where all kinds of other stuff, uh, non-technical stuff matters a lot. And what, who you end up at the end are not the best programmers in, in the world, right? You're going to end up with people who are not highly trained, and they will be trying to drag and drop from some menu things into some very high-level interface in order to make this happen. And that was you know, enough to turn my, my, head, my hair whiter than it was already. OK, so a little more details about this. This, this was, uh, the, again, externally supplied to us. This was the D protocol. So the user uh, starts this whole thing by requesting some resource from a service provider. These are, are numbered, by the way. This is, do I have a pointer with this or no? Anyhow, the number one, there's request resource. Then the, the service provider asks this intermediately, the hub, to, you know, okay, this guy is requesting some resource, find someone to provide an identity for him. So they go to the bank, and the bank does a authentication with the user and, the, uh, and sends the assertion that this user is, you know, has this, this identity you just a uh, unique identifier relate, uh, that the hub also knows. And, it, that the, uh, and there's these attributes associated with this person. And that then the, the hub uh, maps the identifier U known to the bank to the identifier V known by the service provider. So, so part, you know, a, a lot of this is simply to unlink the, the identifiers from the bank, the identifiers from the service provider. And when I saw this, first I said, okay, okay, you know, but, okay, sure, but okay, let's please encrypt those attributes. And I said, sure, we'll encrypt it. So, and the way that it's encrypted is that they, they do a Diffie-Hellman between IDP and Hub and encrypt the attributes, and the hub opens the attributes and re-encrypts them with uh, another secret key shared between the hub and, uh, and the service provider. And I'm going like, wait, wait, the hub is seeing all the attributes. This was supposed to be for privacy, right? And they go, yeah, but it's, of course it's not possible to, the, the, the hub is in the middle, of course he's gonna see all the attributes. And I'm going, no, 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 this is the sort of thing we do in crypto, right? We, we show you how to do this. And then the simple assertion comes during these meetings of saying, no, that's not possible. And I can go, you know, I can jump up and down, get on the table and say, this is possible. And they'll just sit me down and say, sit down, you know, and talk when you're talked to, basically. Uh, and this is the way it went down. This would got codified that way, okay? On the other hand, the Polish document, the people who had thought about all this to begin with, they, you know, they surely wanted these attributes encrypted. This was a, a, you know, a requirement at the higher level. And, and furthermore, they wanted much stronger stuff, much stuff that is not so trivial to provide, which is unlinkability of user transactions in the hub. Okay? And this wasn't being provided by this system. This got deployed and lasted a few years. I, wrote, I Luis and I and some other colleagues from England and Carnegie Mellon, we, we wrote some criticism of this and you know, uh, I almost got my head chopped off. Um, what? This was discontinued in 2015, I believe? Hmm? 
paper is 2015. I'm not an author, by the way. That was part of the. Uh, okay, so you know, Pet can solve this, but but this this the simple thing that I, that it was a like no brainer. You really have to prevent the 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 hub from seeing the attributes was beyond the, the vendor's capabilities. NIST worked for another year with somebody they could trust wasn't me to actually do that. They, they had to do all kinds of very strange con contortions in the environment in which they were programming the solution in order to make this happen. So you know, one of the things I, I take from that is I want uh, I want whatever is needed to make this simple thing happen. I want the, the guy who's not very well trained to be able to grab it from a drop down bin and put it there. And I, I suspect that this is going to happen quite a bit you know, with many different functionalities. So these gadgets that you guys are working, I call them primitives. But I'm, I'm going to change my thinking to gadgets now. Um, I think it's very useful stuff. OK. Um, how long do I have? You kidding me? No? OK. Uh, OK, so I'll hurry up. So another one, another use case that I picked, because it's a, I think it's a very nice example of a need for secure multi-party computation. So the US, we would like to know, make available to the students what are you getting for all this money that you're borrowing to, to go to college? You know, we've had a big scandal over the last 10 years or so or more where students are, are borrowing money to go to schools that are really taking their money and doing nothing. So we'd really like to know, uh, at least do some computation of how, uh, of the return on, on investment for this expense, for these loans. The data necessary to make that computation is spread around many institutions, you know, the lenders, the universities, uh, the IRS. And these entities will not, they, they can't or they can't really go ahead and say, here, have my data. We'll calculate this. So this, this, there's a Congress which just got reintroduced about a month ago. Which you know has, has uh, I think a point a six percent chance of going anywhere uh, now, so it, it probably won't ha would, won't get enacted into law. But this con this law mandates the use of secure multi-party computation to solve this problem. This can be done. Let's just do it. Okay. And you know the, the way at NIST we we get calls from senators from industry and stuff. The the senator that that wants this thing, you know, it says, OK, Nis, you make it happen. Sure. It's not the easiest thing to, to make happen. But I would like to produce at least, it seems like set uh, private set intersection is an important primitive here. And at least I'd like to perhaps produce an in-house some implementation of this, so some reference implementation that we can say, yeah, this costs this much if the parameters are instantiated in the ways that, 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 uh, that this is, uh, that need to be here. OK. Another thing we do is, another thing we do is, I have this idea that not everything in the internet, not, not every useful thing in the internet has a business model associated with it. There are certain things that might be public goods, and the definition of under the you know, economist definition of public goods. One of these things is public randomness. So we've maintained that now for several years, and we're going to maintain for indefinitely a service that every 30, uh, 60 seconds it produces 512 bits of, of uh, entropy. Uh, these these uh, strings are signed and time stamped. They're hash chained for, immutable, for an immutable public record. They're you know, stored forever. Uh, and you know, the, our, our mindset here is we're going to make all kinds of, we're going to do all kinds of cryptographic stuff to this so that it is very hard even for an insider at NIST to mess with this stuff. Yeah. Why not 
Okay, so so th th let me. Th the scenario, w the the scenario is we, one of the th there are many many scenarios uh, for for uh, use of this. So the Brazilians. So so one of the defenses we have is I'm trying to get several different countries, several different institutions to to set this up so that to attack the system you need to attack them all. Okay, the Brazilians want to have this problem where they. There's a lot of corruption when they send the, the trials to judges. So they want, they want to list the trials, list the judges, wait for, for, the next, for the next public randomness thing and assign them according to that. I think that that should answer your question, right? You you can't you need to do a commitment before you know the next randomness. The whole thing is, is you make a commitment and then somebody else does the randomization for you. I see. You use that as like an for randomness for attractive protocols. Yes. Yeah. You know, we're also in the middle of a big replication crisis, and in many fields, we have all these problems that that randomize. Uh, Randomized experiments are not being, you find that they're not replicating themselves. Done? Okay. Well, okay, so we, we need to, um, the service is up and look, look at the many in, interesting applications of this. We do research in multiplicative complexity. This is an important, this, we found that this is important for many uh, zero knowledge stuff because. Uh, this, this field says I have some co some function to compute. I want to not. I want to compute it with using few multiplications. We I think we're right now the world's experts on this. So uh, our perspective on zero knowledge proof. This is well within the reference materials approach that we're, we're thinking. We're very well aligned with that. The co documentation has enormous potential. We've gone through it. I, I think it's very good, and the people involved are very good. We are engaging in this documentation, trying to do stuff, you know, help move it along. And I want, I want to keep the context in mind, use, use context in mind. So I, I, I'd like uh, to, to spend time and then at the end of some long process have developed stuff that is useful to actually solve problems that we have, that we will have. Okay, so final remarks, we are, you know, this is interesting. Uh, we want to reference materials. We want to keep in, you know, we, and we're gonna be engaged with this process. And here's the team and the email address. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Renee.